And these opening chalice lighting words are adapted from Dillman Baker Sorrells. For holy days on which we recall the old stories, we light the flame. For Passover, which reminds us of the courage and strength of those seeking freedom, we light the flame. For Palm Sunday, which reminds us of the risk and commitment at the heart of love, we light the flame. For gathering today, in this sacred time and space, we light the flame. And I invite you to join me in lighting your chalice or a candle at home or wherever you are joining today's service. Please join in singing our opening hymn, Though I May Speak with Bravest Fire, led by our interim music director, Kelly Walker Hart. Oh! 
And hello and good morning, especially to any of our children who might be tuned into worship this morning. Liza and I will be sharing in the time for all ages. And this tambourine might have something to do with our story. You'll have to wait and see. Some of you may be aware that this weekend marks an important holiday in the Jewish tradition, the celebration of Passover or Pesach, which began yesterday at sundown and goes through next Sunday evening. And this holiday is a festival of freedom, and it's based on a story found in the Bible. It's a story from thousands of years ago that has been passed down over the generations. And the story tells of the ancient ancestors of the Jewish people called the Israelites or Hebrews and their struggle for, from, for freedom from slavery in the land of Egypt. The story of Passover and the Exodus, that's like a lot of people leaving at once from Egypt, this story often focuses on the role of an important leader named Moses. And some of us who are not Jewish, especially some of you kids watching, may have learned a little bit about Moses from a movie called The Prince of Egypt, which depicted his role in his people's freedom from slavery. Well, one figure in this story of freedom who is also important, but often not talked about as much, is the older sister of Moses, Miriam. And Liza and I want to tell you a little more about her this morning. So Miriam first appears in the Bible just after baby Moses is born. And Pharaoh was the ruler of Egypt at that time, and he was quite cruel. And he made a rule that all of the male Hebrew children who were born were to be thrown into the Nile River. And Moses' mother wanted to save her baby, and so she hid him for a few months before setting him into a basket and placing the basket in the river in the hopes that his life would be spared. The Pharaoh's daughter found the baby in the basket on the riverbank. And Miriam, the sister of Moses, she was very clever. And she suggested to Pharaoh's daughter that the baby should be given a Hebrew nursemaid. And she brought their own mother forward to nurse the baby, which allowed the mother and baby to be reunited for a short time. But once Moses had stopped nursing, he was returned to Pharaoh's daughter and he grew up, grew up as her son. Under the rule of the Pharaoh in Egypt, the Israelite people suffered greatly. They worked all day and night building palaces and were treated really badly. And they wondered whether their God, who they called Yahweh, would fulfill the promise that was made to their ancestors, that they would live freely. And as the legend goes, it was Moses who would lead them out of captivity. And this was actually something that his sister Miriam had predicted even before Moses was born, that he would be their leader. After Moses grew up and realized who he really was, he warned Pharaoh that terrible things would happen if he didn't let the Hebrew people go. But Pharaoh refused over and over again to give them their freedom until he had finally had enough of all of the terrible things that were happening in Egypt, and he ordered them to leave. So they packed up quickly, afraid that Pharaoh would change his mind. The people were led by Moses, along with his brother Aaron and his sister Miriam. And indeed, Pharaoh sent his army after them. But as they faced the large sea in front of them, a miracle happened and the waters parted and they were able to cross. And as they made it across the Red Sea, the story goes that Miriam broke into song and played a timbrel, which is an instrument like a tambourine. I think Liza's got one too over there. <laughs> And the other women joined her in exuberant celebration and singing and dancing. And this was only the beginning of the journey for the Israelites. They would spend 40 years in the wilderness without a true home. And during that time, Miriam was a key leader of the community. Wow, 40 years in the wilderness. 
I don't think any of us can even imagine that, but raise your hand if you have been camping for a weekend at some point. Even just camping for a weekend, you know that water is a key part of survival, right? And so during their journey through the wilderness, out of slavery, out of Egypt, it is believed that the Israelites received three gifts from God to help them survive. That part of the world is pretty dry without a lot of lakes and rivers like Vermont has. And so can you guess what one of these gifts from God was? Yes, water. They say that God gave them a miraculous well that would not run out of water as long as Miriam, Moses' sister, was alive. And they say that the well journeyed with them as they wandered. This well of living water, Miriam's well as it came to be called, helped keep the Israelites strong and healthy during their long and hard journey. And now the central part of Passover is a ritual feast. It's called the Passover Seder in which Jewish families retell this story of the Exodus. If any of you have ever been to a Passover Seder, and if you're ever invited, I strongly encourage you to go. You've seen a Passover plate with special foods on it to help retell this special story. Along with the Passover plate on the table are some matzah and Elijah's cup filled with wine. And now a new custom that was first introduced by some people in 1989 and is slowly spreading. I know families here in Montpelier who do this, is to place a goblet of water on the Passover table in honor of Miriam and the important role that she played along with her brother, Moses. Miriam's cup, as it is called, is filled with life-saving water and it lifts up the important but sometimes unstated or underappreciated role that Miriam and all the women played in the Passover story. The retelling of this Passover story reminds us that real people, real families were part of this exodus. Children, grandparents, cousins, and friends. And these people had a constant sense of God protecting them during their difficult weeks in the wilderness and the hard months and the years beyond that. Miriam's cup is a way to celebrate the sisters, the protectors, the women leaders, the prophets, the singers, the dancers that keep us going during the hard times today. In the coming days of this week of Passover, we invite you to ponder who are the Miriams in our world? I think maybe that there's a little Miriam in each of us, no matter our gender. Some voice that calls us to nurture and protect those in our community, calling us to share our gifts of life-sustaining water or food for the body, calling us to share our creative gifts of music and dance or story or art to lift our people during times of feeling lost or wandering. To the Miriam in each of you, I raise this cup. Thanks. Our musical interlude also lifts up the preciousness of water and the thirst for water, the thirst for justice, the song is called De Noche. It's in the Teal Hymnal. Um, and it comes to us from the Tizé community in France. Uh, Tizé became a center for refugees during and after World War II and has continued for a center of peace where people come from all over the world, particularly young people, to pray and to lift up um, the the search for peace, the work for peace. And they've developed a sung tradition of singing chants in different languages, often simultaneously. So 
Uh, the choir had a lot of fun putting this together and they will be singing in different languages, English, Spanish, French, de noche. By night we hasten in darkness to search for living water. Only our thirst leaves us onward. Only our thirst leads us onward. I invite you now into a time of prayer and meditation, a time to tune into the condition of your own heart, to open yourself to the connection to each and every person gathered across distance and location, across devices and screens into this shared time of worship, a time to deepen your connection to all that is beyond your singular self. 
We acknowledge during this time of contemplation, meditation, and prayer, the many sources of joy and sorrow that may be present in our community today. We lift up the joy and gratitude on your hearts, the celebrations and milestones and achievements within our community. We hold tenderly all of the concerns and sorrows present amongst us this morning, personal challenges of health, physical, mental, emotional, financial concerns and struggles, the personal losses and grief, and the concerns you hold for our broader community. I share with you a reminder that we have a lay pastoral caregiver available each Sunday to offer you a listening ear after the service. And today's lay pastoral caregiver is Art Stuckey, and Art will be sharing his phone number in the Zoom chat. I have a few pastoral concerns from our church community that I'd like to share with you now. First, Melissa Oliva shares the joy of having her good friend, Emilia, and her daughter moving to the Montpelier area from El Salvador. They're looking forward to finding community and a safe place to call home. Melissa wants to thank all of the wonderful members of our UU community who have already sent them welcoming thoughts and clothes to be warm. Thank you. Vicki Viennes shares a concern for her brother-in-law in Florida who's struggling with cancer, as well as for her nephew who has a mild case of COVID. Sending loving thoughts to both of them. And finally, I'm so pleased to share that we, we will be holding a Zoom memorial service for longtime church member Ted Richards on Saturday, May 15th at 2 p.m. Mark your calendars, and I hope you'll be able to join in that important occasion. If you have a personal joy or concern that you'd like for others to know about, you can share that now by typing it into the Zoom chat or the Facebook comments at this time. I will not be reading those aloud, but I invite you to, to read those joys and concerns for yourself as they are shared and to offer words of support as you are moved to do so. And let us join in taking a few deep breaths as those words appear and we hold with care all that is being shared this morning. And let us hold this spirit of compassion as we continue our time of meditation and prayer. We are people with hearts full of gladness and hearts full of sorrow. And for too many days, it seems like the sorrows keep piling up with all that weighs heavy upon our hearts this day, we seek something more alive than the numbness that can too easily befall our spirits. A numbness from the grief stacked upon grief, from yet another mass shooting, from yet more efforts to curtail voting rights, yet another cycle of shock, sadness, anger, cynicism and despair. Let us hold with compassion all those whose suffering feels like it is too much to bear and all those whose pain pushes them towards destruction. Let us hold in our hearts this morning our trans siblings and the upcoming Transgender Day of Visibility May all trans and gender nonconforming people know their inherent worth and dignity and be seen for the fullness of who they are. May those with power have the courage to act with boldness and clarity to seek protection for the vulnerable and to stem the violence that plagues us. And that could be stopped if we were but bold enough to claim life over death. 
May those of us who feel powerless know our own ability to make change wherever we are. In this season of spring beginnings, of ancient and ancestral story, may wisdom be our guide and hold us in the expansiveness of time as we find our place and listen for our deepest calling. And let us now share in a time of quiet meditation at the close of which we will sing Spirit of Life. The reading this morning transports us in time to first century CE Jerusalem. And this reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament of the Bible. And it tells the story of the entry of Jesus of Nazareth into Jerusalem, which is the basis for the Christian holiday of Palm Sunday being celebrated today. The image being shared now is an artistic depiction of this event by John August Swenson. When they neared Jerusalem, having arrived at Bethphage on Mount Olives, Jesus sent two disciples with these instructions. Go over to the village across from you. You'll find a donkey tethered there, her colt with her. Untie her and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you're doing, say, the master needs them. He will send them with you. The disciples went and did exactly what Jesus told them to do. They led the donkey and colt out, laid some of their clothes on them, and Jesus mounted. Nearly all the people in the crowd threw their garments down on the road, giving him a royal welcome. Others cut branches from the trees and threw them down as a welcome mat. Crowds went ahead and crowds followed all of them calling out, Hosanna to David's son. Blessed is he who comes in God's name. Hosanna in highest heaven. As he made his entrance into Jerusalem, the whole city was shaken. Unnerved, people were asking, what's going on here? Who is this? The parade crowd answered, this is the prophet Jesus, the one from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus went straight to the temple and threw out everyone who had set up shop, buying and selling. 
He kicked over the tables of loan sharks and the stalls of dove merchants. He quoted this text. My house was designated a house of prayer. You have made it a hangout for thieves. Now there was room for the blind and crippled to get in. They came to Jesus and he healed them. Here ends the reading. When the pandemic emerged over a year ago, people in our community without stable housing faced particularly difficult challenges. Homeless shelters became health risks for the spread of COVID-19 given the close and shared quarters. Social service agencies and the state grappled with the question of how to meet the need for a safe housing option for those experiencing homelessness. The Hilltop Inn on Airport Road in Berlin, up near the hospital, some of you I think know where that is, became one of the motels across the state utilized for emergency housing as an extension of the state's motel voucher system. Currently, there are about 2,700 people living in one of 75 motels across the state. With the support of Another Way over on Berry Street, guests of the Hilltop Inn and other area motels organized an event last month to share their stories. They called it the Motel Guest Freedom and Unity Forum. And it was designed to highlight the stories, challenges and opportunities of the 100 people living at the Hilltop Inn and other motels. The event was an opportunity for concerned allies to bear witness to these stories and to provide support for empowerment through respectful listening and offerings of support. The gathering was grounded in the principle that those in the best position to advocate for needs are the people living the experience. And I was able to attend much of the day's gathering for a few hours in person and also virtually using Zoom. One of the main organizers of the event, someone who has been quote unquote, hotel housed, as she called it, for most of the pandemic, described feeling as if she and others had become invisible. Meanwhile, she noted the community, she noted the community that has also formed at the inn and at other motels, a community of mutual care and meaningful engagement that's unseen from the outside. That feeling of invisibility motivated her to want to organize this forum. One motel guest shared how homelessness has become a chronic condition for him as he has dealt with ongoing mental health issues that have made it difficult to maintain employment. And he's actually from a different part of the state. And while getting set up with a room at the Hilltop was good from a housing perspective, all of his emotional support, his friends, counselors, all of that was left behind. He shared a sentiment that probably resonates with many of us, though for different reasons. He said, I don't know what tomorrow brings. After the session in which this particular guest spoke, I made my way outside to my car as it was lunchtime and I wanted to return to my church office for that meal. And I passed this guest as he stood outside smoking a cigarette. I thanked him for sharing his story and he thanked me for listening and also reiterated that his only option is to use his voice to speak out and that he's been doing it for so long. For those of us who can rely on stable housing day in and day out, it can be easy to remain unaware or to ignore the pressing needs and the life experiences of those in our broader community facing housing challenges and homelessness. Attending the forum last month, I became more acutely aware of my own physical and social separation from those who are currently hotel housed. Along with some of you, I have been active with Vermont Interfaith Actions Campaign over the last several years to end homelessness in Washington County. 
And the group has made steady progress in their organizing, continues to do so today. But even so, I began to wonder how I could possibly address this separation, what any of us who feel committed to serving human need could be doing differently. I believe that Jewish and Christian teachings, which we are especially lifting up in today's service, point towards the ongoing need and religious calling to examine the systems and practices that keep an underclass in place of those who are deemed other and stranger. These teachings invite us to ask ourselves how we can work towards the possibility of flourishing for all. Rabbi Deborah Waxman says this of Passover. More than ever, we must remember that we were redeemed from slavery in Egypt to serve the highest principles, which we must constantly seek to discern. We were freed in order to enter into a covenantal relationship with each other and the divine. Our work is to ensure the liberation and well being of all people. Now, Rabbi Waxman is speaking specifically of Jewish people as the we in this reflection. And yet I believe all of us can be inspired by this call to serve the highest principles and ensure the liberation and well being of all people. Today, we also recognize Palm Sunday and the Christian Holy Week, which begins today. And within this story, we can also find wisdom for addressing the social concerns of our time. The ministry of Jesus of Nazareth, as short as it was, threatened the political and religious powers of his time. His storied entry into Jerusalem turned conventional wisdom on its head. Here was a man who was both feared and also mocked for being prophesied to be a new king. Some of you who were raised in Christian churches and households may equate Palm Sunday as a triumphant kind of moment, but Jesus's entry atop a donkey could also be understood as a comic mockery of Pontius Pilate's entry into the royal city, an absurd and ironic commentary on power. Debbie Thomas, a Christian scholar, writes, as Pilate clanged and crashed his imperial way into Jerusalem from the west, Jesus approached from the east, looking, by contrast, ragtag and absurd. Unlike the Roman emperor and his legions who ruled by force, coercion, and terror, Jesus came defenseless and weaponless into his kingship. Riding on a donkey, he all but cried aloud the bottom line truth that his rule would have nothing to recommend it but love, humility, long suffering, and sacrifice. I think it's telling that after the spectacle of the procession into Jerusalem, Jesus goes to the temple. There he is said to have driven away those looking to make a profit on the steps of that important religious site. And instead he made room for those on the edges of society who were in need of healing. One of the messages shared at the motel guest Freedom and Unity Forum was an encouragement to make the effort to pay attention to the stories and life experiences of those who are or, or who have experienced homelessness. And for some of you, this isn't too hard. This may be your own story or that of a loved one or friend. It may be your life's work to provide services to those living on the economic margins. Others of you may have to stretch a bit and go out of your way to know these stories. And this can be especially true during the pandemic while we aren't able to open our church doors to whoever may show up for a community lunch in the vestry or for worship on Sunday morning. It takes commitment to continue to keep at the forefront the needs of those who might be deemed other or marginal 
due to their housing or economic status, to keep centering those who are living the experience and who are being directly impacted by decisions and policies out of their control. Commitment, as it shows up in the story of the Exodus and in the life and ministry of Jesus, is not an easy path. Commitment of this magnitude transforms lives. There's no going back despite the uncertainty of the journey ahead. And this commitment to freedom and justice shows up in very real and ordinary ways. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel once wrote, the teaching of Judaism is the theology of the common deed. The Bible insists that God is concerned with everydayness. The prophet's field of concern is not the mysteries of heaven, the glories of eternity, but the blights of society, the affairs of the marketplace. This theology of the common deed is being lived out through the work of people in our local community seeking solutions to the affordable housing and homelessness crisis. As I mentioned earlier, Vermont Interfaith Action, of which the Unitarian Church of Montpelier is a member, has been partnering with other groups to bring about policy changes to create more permanent housing options. This is very much the work of the common deed as Heschel describes with research into funding and budgets and talking with legislators and listening to the stories of those who have been without housing for far too long. I invite you to mark April 15th on your calendar for a virtual public action on this topic. VIA will present the results of their research. Our neighbors who have experienced homelessness will share their stories. And together we will ask for legislative commitments to establish permanent housing options that are affordable and supportive. There are more details in this week's e-news about that event. So this Passover week, this Holy Week, I invite you to reflect on your own commitments and how you are being called to live with love and humility in service of the stranger. May each of us from our own place of inner truth and wisdom and sustained in community be agents of freedom, liberation, welcome, and justice. So may it be. And let us join our hearts in song now for our closing hymn, We'll Build a Land. Please note that we will be singing people together in the chorus line for gender inclusivity. I invite you to sing along from wherever you are. Oh, we'll build a promise. 
Our generosity is a form of love and gratitude. Our gifts freely given help us to practice Unitarian Universalism within and beyond our congregation. Each month through the UCM Community Pouch Program, we share part of our collection with an important church fund or a community organization aligned with our values. And during the month of March, our Community Pouch recipient is the Barry Area Senior Center. Your contribution to the community pouch this month will directly support their work. You can make a financial contribution today by donating online. Go to ucmvt.org, click donate to UCM, and there are options there to contribute to the general fund, which supports the general operating budget of the church, to the community pouch, or to both. You can also mail a check to the church, or you can use our text to give option by sending a text message with the word give to 802-266-4848 and just follow the instructions that are sent back to you. We are so grateful to each and every one of you for your generosity in its many forms. And now I am happy to share with you a brief message from Scott Hess and Amy Willis, along with Janet and John Poten for our Together We Thrive Pledge Drive. Hi, I'm Scott Hess. And I'm Amy Willis, Scott Hess's wife. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm her husband. We're talking here from Ground Zero at the community lunch that right now is mothballed just for a little bit. But this is one of the major reasons, and in addition to many other reasons, but to serve human needs. And the lunch that we had to put on hold, we put a few in the middle, but um, we now have it participating with the Everyone Eats program. And every Monday, we're still handing out meals outside and providing to those that are in need. But we will be back, and this mission will be carried on, and uh, we'll be back. And it fits so well, just our love of community. That community and just the whole community at the Unitarian Church, it's really become family and such an important part of our lives. We also support the community lunch. I'm Janet. And I'm John Poten. And each Monday we've been with um, Scott and Amy at different times to provide lunches. We pack bags and uh, treats as well as baked good desserts. Thank you for all the bakers. The, the funding, we, we've been uh, distributing lunch every single Monday during the, the pandemic. Funding for the entree comes from state and federal funding, uh, but we also use uh, funding from our budget uh, to add things to our lunch, like, like fruit and desserts and granola bars and nuts and, and other things that will supplement the, the, the entrees. Uh, we're, we're very proud that we've been able to do this throughout the winter, uh, and it's thanks to the fact that we, that community lunch is included in our church budget. The other things that we support and encourage is the music of the of UCM. It provides such a stimulating community for us as well as others, the youth, and the fact that our staff is so important and they have been working diligently. They have strengths and skills that have really shown through this pandemic year. And because of that, uh, we believe that the staff deserves uh, all the, f the fringe benefits that the 
and it's possible for the church to fund and that the resources for that comes from the from the pledge drive and that's why we pledge and we hope you also will join in and make a pledge this year Thank what you. we have what we have in our church is determined by by the number the amount that we gather in our pledges so be sure and pledge Thank you. And so we're so happy that we've pledged and we're thanking everyone who has pledged already. And those of, the, those of you that are considering, please think about giving a pledge and bringing it, either dropping it off or handing it in as soon as possible. So thank you so much and uh, enjoy the spring. Thank you. Take care. Thank you to all who have already made a pledge towards next year's budget. We are making wonderful progress in adding leaves to our tree of gratitude and generosity. Let me see if I can manage to show, oh, that's the tambourine. There it is. Thank you all so much. We are now up to 105 pledges made, totaling over $233,000. And the Stewardship Committee and I encourage you to get your pledge in by this Thursday, April 1st. Yes, April is coming. If at all possible, using the pledge envelope that was mailed to you or using the online pledge form. As we draw our service to a close, we extinguish the chalice and carry within each of us its healing flame, the warmth of community, and the spark of commitment into the days and week ahead. And as we do so, let us join in saying the mission statement of the Unitarian Church of Montpelier. We welcome all as we build a loving community to nurture each person's spiritual journey, serve human need and protect the earth, our home. And may you go in peace this day and return again in love. We conclu conclude our service now with the postlude.